I could just have people just come on up, we'll, we'll just make this easy on you. Or Dan or Dan, I don't even know. Whoever back there, just come on up, get closer. That will just be easy. Perfect. That way I don't have to yell back there. Um, thank you, first of all, for having me. Like, quick disclaimer, I don't have a lot of um, experience in global health. But I do run um, Aqua Africa. It's a nonprofit organization that provides access to clean water in um, in South Sudan. I think it's very important for you guys to know like a little about who I am and where I came from, just so I could uh, properly communicate what I do and why I do it. So I was born, um, like Victoria mentioned, in South Sudan. At the time of Sudan, we fought like we were fighting in the war for about 21 years. So. Um, a lot of people were involved in the war at that time. I was involved when I was a child. My older brother was involved. My father was involved. But um, my oldest brother passed away in the war, so during the struggle. And when that happened, my father was saying, well, you know, like, this has become too dangerous of a place for us to stay. So we um, migrated to Ethiopia. My mother, incidentally, is uh, Ethiopian and is a Jew, is an Ethiopian Jew. So we just have a, like a wide, complex family structure there. <laughs> so um, we moved to Ethiopia. We lived in Ethiopia for about um, six months. And my father started advocating for children not to fight in the war anymore in, uh, in South Sudan. So, and he's, he became a, like an avid advocate. And the general in South Sudan became, you know, started getting irritated. So he sent out a list of um, adjutants that needed to be arrested. The general in South Sudan had a relationship with Mengustu Halamariam, which was the dictator at the time in um, Ethiopia. So they got my father's name on the list and all we know is we're eating dinner one day and federal police break through the door and escort him to prison. So he was in prison for about, you know, three, no, yeah, two years. Two years coming on to uh, three. And the government in, in uh, Ethiopia gets toppled. So Mella Suzinawi overthrows Mengistu Halamariam and takes over the country. And incidentally, at that time, part of the agreement he made with the international community to be a legitimate government is to give people asylum, the political prisoners asylum. So my father was released out of prison, and then we came to the United States um, on asylum basis. So um, when we came, the United well, the United Nations gave us a choice between um, going into Canada or the United States, of course. We're like Canada, that kind of sounds cold. We're not going there. <laughs> so ended up in Minnesota, which wasn't any different. <laughs> so, I was horrible, and um, and then we moved here into Nebraska in 1998 when the snowstorm hit, <laughs> and that was pretty rough. So my father kept making one bad decision after another. So um, we've and we've lived here ever since. Um, and I went to Burke High School, graduated um, Heartland Christian, actually, in Council Bluffs, and then went to University of Nebraska at Omaha and uh, graduated there with political science and economics. So upon graduation, I wanted to go work for a nonprofit. And South Sudan at that time, where we're getting our independence from Sudan, Finally, um, George Bush made sure that we had a referendum. Actually, one of the referendum locations for South Sudan to seek its independence was here in Omaha. So Omaha has one of the largest South Sudanese immigration populations so in the country. So one of the voting places were here, and I voted for my country to become independent here, So that, which is great. Fought in the war, and I got to vote here, get its freedom. So we became an independent country, and I wanted to go help. So one of the things I wanted to do is work in the water sector because I knew how difficult it was when I was a child in order to retrieve water. So when that happened, I, I went to go work. I got a job opportunity to work for um, Charity Water in New York. They needed a country director in uh, Sudan at that time was going to be South Sudan. So they needed a South Sudanese director. So I went and in the meeting, me and the guy were talking and he's like, so where are you from? And I was telling him, well, I'm from uh, South Sudan. He's like South Sudan, that's insane. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, that's great. Um, which part of South Sudan are you? I'm like, I'm from Upper Nile State. Like what village? Like, you wouldn't know it. He's like, just try me. And I was like, well, I'm from a small village called Maiwood. 
a guy goes, my wood, we used to work there. And when I was a child, because we lived three miles away from the Nile. So me and my, like my mom, my father was out at war at that time. Me and my mom used to go to the river all the time, grabbing water and bring it back. I didn't have any sisters. So it was just, I was stuck to do the work. So we used to always do that. And then like these guys came to our village and drilled a water well. And that was the first time I've ever seen water at its pure state. So I've never seen water like this before, like unless it's raining. So, and I thought it was unnatural because all I know is the river. Like I grew up in the river, I drank the river. That's how I grew up with. So they drilled the water well, we got this water and around four or five months later, the water well breaks. And of course my mom doesn't know how to fix the well. So like we just left it alone. It was just a chain that broke. We didn't know how to fix it. So we went back to the river. So the guy in the meeting tells me, yeah, he's like, we, but we never went back there. Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so <laughs> it was during that time. I was like, well, I'm going to leave then. So um, at the time I was like, great, I'll consider the offer. And then I left. And um, I called my best friend up and my best friend, Jacob, me and him grew up in the village together. So I was like, hey, man, you remember that white guy that came into our village when we were kids? He's like, yeah, I remember that guy. It's like, well, yeah, that guy, I just had an interview with him. <laughs> He's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, I just had an interview about the water tank. He's like, yeah, that guy never came back. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the interview. <laughs> so, like, great. So, um, how are the Chicago Bulls doing? Of course, we went on a tangent. We're, we're friends. So we talked about something else. But it was during that time I thought I wanted to go back and actually do something in our community where it lasts, where we set up a system in a way because we understand the people, we know how important water was that we wanted to work in those communities. And like I said, when I was a kid, I grew up right around the Nile. And I used to remember the village people telling us, don't swim in the Nile because it gets you sick. So we're like, why does it get you sick? You know, like in your skin, it gets into your skin or dry out your skin. And then we're like, yeah, that's terrible. And then drink the water. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, drink a lot of water to stay hydrated. So it was insane that, you know, we didn't put one and uh, one and one together. We thought, well, if we're going to go back to South Sudan, let's actually do something that we could do a holistic approach. Now, this wasn't a global health kind of a concern to us. To us, this is a practical thing, you know, that we wanted to do because we're from there. So we started Aqua Africa. When we started Aqua Africa it was in 2006 with research and development. We wanted to know what we we're going to do, how we we're going to administer aid. And one of the things we talked about is, well, we can't really administer aid. Vicky. I know Vicky, obviously. <laughs> um, we wanted to administer aid in uh, South Sudan in a kind of a, a different way where it is sustainable in a sense that we wanted to like a lot of the times I think sustainability isn't really defined in terms of um, how you want sustainability to apply. Is it financially? Is it, does it have to stay there for 2000 years for it to be sustainable or can the, like the community sustain it? But for us, it was practical. We didn't want six months later for a mom to be like the chain is broken. So I'm going to go back to the river and get my um, kids sick. But for that cost, the mom and that community to, pay for that um, that type of material because it doesn't come free. So what we came up with was with the Aqua Africa, we said we wanted to focus the higher level of the philosophy of the organization is development over aid. Because none of us wanted just to administer, the, um, one, none of us wanted to administer aid because it's just a bandage solution which our community, our village, my village, is going to have to go back to the river later. We wanted to actually move forward and we wanted to move up. So what we did with that is when we we're focusing on development, we said we'll focus on three areas. One of them is basically access to clean water. And one of our taglines is without water, nothing can grow. You can say whatever you want in our community. We weren't going to drill 100 meters into the ground and get water. So for us, we're going to go to the river. So if you're going to come to our community and tell us, yeah, you need to figure out a way to drill with a shovel 110 meters, be like, get the hell out of here. We'll go to the river. So it's not like you can't you can't mess around with that. So 
we we were resigned to the fact that we're going to have to spend you know around six seven thousand dollars in these communities and drill 110 meters because if we don't do that they're going to go to the river they they just don't have the um, capital to do it the know-how to do it or at that point the knowledge to do it so access to clean water is first and foremost the second thing we wanted to focus is what we call micro democracy and uh, by micro democracy we would use the water as an access point. So we drill one well for about 500 people. And that could vary depending on the population. It could be 250 to 500 people. When we drill the well, we actually help them elect members of committees. So we set up these small boxes around the community, and then they go and vote for people that they want on their uh, members of committee. And those committee members make decisions on how much the water is used, when it is used, and how much they're going to charge which is very important to come from the community to tell the rest of the people who are democratically um, elected. Now, that has an implicit um, kind of objective, an explicit objective. The like explicit objective, obviously, we want them to elect their members of committees and we want them to feel good about that. The implicit objective is we want them to understand how democracy works on a grassroots level. The importance of secret ballots, the importance of term limits, these things, doing it practically for the people, actually them taking the part in it. We're hoping later on in the election process, they go, well, we elected these six people to run our water committee. Why can't we elect that uh, guy that's been telling us what to do for this long, saying he's never going to step down? So we just wanted to empower him in that term. And the third most effective thing that we like to do is um, what we call, uh, what was it, resource management. Resource management is very important because in, in, our, in our location, people assume water like air, it's free. Now, to our people, I mean, even in, just think about it, in the United States, if we go, if we say we're going to put some kind of um, carpet and cap or things like that, because the air is important to us. To us, that's a, that's a foreign concept. Unless you're an, an econom or economist, you well, how do you tax air? How do you put value on that? And to our people, it's the same thing. Water to them is natural. It's from God. No one could charge for it. So what we do in the community we work in is we say, well, taking water out of the ground takes mechanisms. And that in itself is value. Whenever you add value, you have to pay for that in order to maintain that value and then pay to their um, water committee. And that water committee uses that money to maintain the water wells. So we've been working since 2011 and uh, we, um, we've drilled over 23 wells now, hand pump wells. And there are organizations that would do 23 wells in uh, like in a year. So, but what we like to do is actually work in the communities, work with the communities. And we work for about three or four months with each communities we work with. We set up um, community banks where we leave materials for the community that they could purchase from the people. The other philosophy we like, we like to use, we sell this stuff to the community. We don't give it to them. And the only reason why, that we do that is pushing capitalism to his full, I know this is a college and you guys are going to be like, well, capitals and that's terrible. <laughs> but to us, that's the only way it works. When you sell it to the people and then they have to sell it to others, they take care of it. It doesn't get stolen and it has value. So and that's very important to us. The other thing that they have to do is 15 percent of the project cost has to come from them. And the way we do that is practical. I mean, we tell them, well, if you have cash, give us cash. If you don't have cash, we need sand, we need gravel, and we need labor. So that budget cost has to be offset by the community. So if you're going to want to come and um, gather rocks, gather sand, anything that we have to pay for, you could do that. And some villagers will tell you, we're not going to do that. We'll just give you the money for it. And we're like, all right, fine. Like, you can't really disagree with that. So now the important thing becomes... How does this really apply to global health? And this picture, I mean, well, these three sets of pictures does a really good job showing you how this works. This is the first village we've ever worked in. Its name is Langabu. This is how they access their water. This is their own effort. And this is after years of digging into the water, 
I'm trying to get it. And a lot of people, I mean, whenever you see this picture, it's easy to disengage the human beings from the condition. These are human beings making humanistic decisions, just like all of us. If we were put in the same this situation, we would do the same exact thing. There's nothing different. Only the circumstances are different. Now, these people, I mean, they have to access water. They have to drink water. So, But the way they access water is by digging this um, down in, like, down into the ground. The first time I went and saw that, I mean, I was disheartened. I walked down there to check out how they get their water. This place, I mean, it's really telling because it's not only the people, but it's full of bees. The bees also need to drink water. I'm allergic to bees, heavily. So I like I walk down here and then walk right back up. But you only see a portion of the picture. This is the water. I mean, these jugs you see go for I mean, yards. People line up to get their water. And then they start from 5 a.m. to all the way to 10, 11 a.m. And what that does is it takes their time, consumes a lot of time. I joked earlier I didn't have a sister, so I had to go do this with my mom. And that's not a joke that was real. I hated that job. So my mom, like, I come out of my hut. My mom sees me. I have to go with her. So if my older brother is around, I implicate him. So he goes and gets the water. <laughs> but the other thing we forget is if you have a sister, that's her job. There's no debate. So while the brother goes to school and gets educated and gets like that, they have to walk two or three miles to get this water. And a lot of the times you also forget water is heavy. Water is very heavy. So trying to carry this back, the best portion of that walk is to the river. Then you bring it back and then you have to drink that water. And some people are like, well, why don't they boil it? You just spent four hours bringing this water. And now you're going to sit in front of a fire boiling it. So a lot of the time we have to think of the practical aspect of how development works because these are human beings. So this place, the first places that I saw in Lungabu, the first place we were going to drill, we brought in our trucks and we're going to go to work. Interesting thing, the machine on our driller like or our drilling rig, the, what was it, the hydraulic pumps on it breaks. Hydraulic pumps on it, and Dr. Libby earlier in our panel mentioned, you know, you have to go into the city in order to get materials, and that's very true. So I had to go to Juba, like which is the capital city, trying to get the hydraulics for, for the machine. Actually, the driller tells me, look, I'm going to go into Juba, and I'll be back in several hours. And, you know, that's South Sudan. That means in several days. I don't, I don't buy anything the driller said. So I'm like, I'll go with you. We get stopped by police officers, like the community police. The community police tell us, look, a cow was hit two days ago, and we have reasons to believe that it's you guys. I'm like, well, what reasons do you have to believe it's us? And then they're like, well, there's a truck going in and out, and you're the only truck, and the cow is dead. I'm like, well, where's the cow? And then they're like, don't worry about the cow. <laughs> like, this is the most insane thing we've ever heard. So I'm talking to this guy in Arabic. The driller is, um, what was it, Indian. And we have a huge fuel shortage in South Sudan. We're only 10 million people. The country is the size of Texas. And we've been fighting a war for 21 years. I don't, I don't have a friend in South Sudan that didn't fight in the war. So, so the guy goes, well, like, you guys hit a cow. You, um, you either pay for this or, you know, or else. I'm like, or else? What are you going to do? Put me in jail. So that's like two days in jail for, um, for hitting a cow. And the locals had to come and actually negotiate with them in order to get them out. But I'll tell you this. I was in that like little cell that they had in the dead day of heat. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go back to America and get a job where it's air conditioned and forget this place. I mean, like, why am I coming back to this place? It's hard to think. Again, like it just comes down to their people, and people have different intentions depending on who they are. Police officers, you can taint the whole community by the actions of those two cops. We left in order to go drill the well. We've we're drilling like we're finishing. I'm I'm completely resigned to the place. I'm like as soon as the 
this project is done, I'm going to go back to the U.S. and live in Nebraska for the rest of my life. I'm done with this <laughs> stuff. So we, we drill and drill and drill, and finally we get the water. The water comes out, and we're I put the one of the waters in a bottle like this and kind of tap it around. The way we test water when we were there is, like, put it in, the villagers are like, well, drink it. So we're like, this is the safest water you could drink. And then they're like, well, drink it. So I, I drank it, of course. And one of the little kid comes up and he's like, hey, man, is that how you guys filter water? So what are you talking about? I didn't get what that kid meant. But when I was on the plane, I thought about it. The first time when I was like, I lived in the village, like I said, I didn't live in a city. And a lot of people assume all Africans live in villages, which we don't. I lived in the countryside, like Nebraskans here in the countryside, you know? So I was disconnected from a lot of things. And the first time I saw water that didn't look like this, actually looked like it, was when that guy brought it to our village. And then when it came to our, um, when it came out of our well. And that's the first time that kid's seen that. Now, that made me, that brought back the whole feeling of, okay, this is what I'm meant to do, this is what I love to do. But then in the context of global health, if you've never seen water that looked like this, and every day you're consuming water like this, imagine the impact. I used to remember growing up, you, stomach aches was a common occurrence. Like, it was weird for me that, like, once I came here, like, I never thought about stomach aches again, which is weird. But when I was a kid, I used to, like, probably, you know, throughout a week, think about it three or four times get random headache, get random sicknesses. And then my family used to say, don't swim in the river during, we have all these mystic things where if you swim in the blazing heat, you get sick and blah, blah, blah. So anyways, that kind of stuff happened. But now why, this makes me feel like, this makes me feel good to come to Ghana in terms of global um, health is, once you drill a water well, when you build a school, you don't know the impact whether it's six, seven years because people need to get educated and that education has to become something else before it can impact the community. Water happens the next day. The impact of water happens the next day. You drill the water, they see the water, the village has changed the next day. And it's really important to understand how basic that is, but how life changing that is in the community that you operate in. I often hear like, well, you know, especially girls, they don't get education. As soon as you build them a water well, they'll go get education. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like an African tale people tell. So I never bought into it. And then I thought about it. Yeah, I grew up with brothers. So I, like, of course it didn't keep me from school. My mom could keep me from school. I didn't want to go to school. So I'm like, getting water is better. But if we had a sister, that's, there's no debate. Like, that's what she was going to do. And we, we drilled, like I said, 23 wells over 10, um, 10 different communities. And when we drill a well, you go into, I mean, you face a lot of obstacles. One of the important things we need to do instead of just drilling in with the micro democracy is basic training when it comes to health and um, when it comes to health and water water treatment, you think you drill a water well and then they're safe. It's not. They put them into these containers. You don't know how to sanitize these containers. It doesn't matter what you did about extracting clean water. It gets contaminated there. If they don't close the water lid, the thing, especially in these communities, every living thing needs water. If you leave it open the way like you went to go in a hole to go find water, Insects do the same exact thing. So you bring it into community, you leave it open like that, you leave it for contamination. One of the important things we like to do with the kids is actually put uh, glitter on their hand. When you talk about germs, if they don't see it, they don't know it. And kids get bored quick. Again, they're like children like everywhere else. If you're like, sit down here, I'm going to teach you about germs, they'll be like, see ya, I've got something else to do. So we're like, we got to give them glitter and be like, look at how germs transfer and things like that. And that visual makes a huge impact on it. And when it comes to, I mean, we don't do a complete health kind of assessment, health training, because we're not capable. We're a small organization. We're three people in the organization. 
the what we like to do is something practical that we think is going to stay. I mean, it's going to impact the community in a different way in terms of our mission, which is access to clean water. So if we spend one well costs us about fifty thousand dollars, eleven to fifteen, depending on where we go. If you're looking at just drilling the water well and you're like good, you're fine to go, and we leave them alone. And then they put them into these containers without actually sanitizing the containers. You did nothing. I mean, unless they drink the water now, you minimize their health, but that doesn't really do much. In terms of South Sudan as a whole, around 40 to 60 percent of our population—that's 10 million people—don't have access to clean water. So, of the 60, I mean, uh, of the 10 million people of our population, 60. 40 to 60 percent don't have access. So 40 to 60 percent basically go to these ponds, go to rivers, or collect rain in order to um, have access to clean water. In Juba, in our capital city, now keep in mind, whenever I mean people say this kind of stuff, especially when we're from Africa, people have the tendency to paint Africa as a whole country, and we're all broke, and, like desperate. We're not. South Sudan is a special case because we've been fighting for independence for 21 years. In our capital city itself, we don't have any connected water systems. So, peak, like, it is an actual business. You'll bring a water, like, a fuel tank. You drive that fuel tank around from building to building, and you sell water. So, for about 70 to to $100 a day, that's how, like, your compound in the capital city access to water. There is no tap water. Last year, we approached a company here called Lamper Renierson. And uh, Lamper Renierson is an engineering firm, actually two years ago. And we talked about, look, and uh, a guy, it was a guy that I talked to, I told him his name is Mike McGuigan, told him about the story about the water tanks in South Sudan and Juba, and how the water gets transferred by trucks. He says, well, can we do something different? Like, yeah, I guess. Then he goes, well, why don't we build a small miniature water system for a community? Well, like, how would that work? He's like, it, basically, it would be like small town water towers, but we'll make them smaller so it fits into a community. He said, all right, about six months into a development, he created a water tank, what we call a village supplier. Basically, it's just a water, um, a water tank that's, what was it? We drill 110 meters into the ground, and instead of putting a hand pump well, we power the well, we power the pump, submersible pump by solar, put it into a tank, distribute it into the community. So we worked in a different village. Hopefully I have this here. I'm not good with technology. Oh, okay, here, I got it. Mike is this guy right here. But we'll, we'll come back to all of this. We built the first water system here, as we called it the village supplier, and um, we installed this in a community called New Lake, and it serves about 5,000 people a day. And basically, the water is, gets pumped into the water tank uh, by the solar power you see up top, and then it's in the community. And then they access water to, I mean, basically the first running water in those communities. The advantage that we saw there, in addition to saving people time, now specifically when it comes to health, we control the quality of the water. So now that the water is being pumped up here, it can be treated. Now, did we treat it? No, we did not. Because this was our first one and we didn't have the capability to. So a lot of the water comes directly from the ground, goes into the tank, gravity feeds into the distribution points. So we try to serve about um, 5,000 people. This year, we're working on building a water system for a pediatric hospital. And a, uh, the pediatric hospital will be the first of its kind in South Sudan in a location called Kajukeji. And what we're trying to do there is actually the, base, uh, the same basic concept make it four times as big, and actually treat the water because we're serving the pediatric hospital, has to also, um, the water has to be treated. Of course, the people are more vulnerable, they're sick. And when you're 
The other big thing to realize when it comes to vulnerable people, children and elderly. That's the ones that are hit the most when it comes to this. Like I said, when I was a kid, I used to remember a lot of the times having headaches, stomach aches. Then you get older, you get tougher, and then you get, I mean, when you're old, it's pretty much a rat. <laughs> so, um, so for the PTASH hospital, and the other thing I would I will point out in this, um, we've been incredibly lucky in terms of getting expertise to where people step up and help us out in different areas. And um, when I first talked to Victoria, and like when I was getting invited to come speak here, she mentioned that you know she was an engineer before, and her husband also was a involved in um, water treatment. And I was like, great, put him on, on our operation committee. <laughs> so we're gonna pull him in. But um, so the pediatric hospital, we're actually trying to serve 30,000 people, um, 30, people a year. The hospital itself, we're not working at it. It's called Healing Study Foundation. It's a nonprofit that was started by an, um, an organization here in Omaha that was started by uh, a South Sudanese so going back and helping out. So he came here, became a physician, and wants to help South Sudan. They're building the clinic. We're building the water system for the clinic. And the water system, we build a water system and also surrounding community. Now, we're work, working in South Sudan. Unfortunately, we're kind of back at civil war. We're not officially calling it a civil war, but for all intents and purposes, it's a civil war, which makes our supply lines incredibly difficult trying to get materials in and then trying to get talent into the country, which um, which is another difficulty. So in, I mean, in bringing it all back, I would say one of the titles is Why, Why Clean Water? In terms of what we do, and when I look at organizations that are working in a developing country, with food and things like that, with building education, providing health care and everything else, it's perfect, but unless you have the water there, that's the first contact people have. They'll drink water two or three times a day, it depend, especially in South Sudan. If the water is contaminated, they could go seek health care. They'll come back and then drink that same water. And in the communities you work in, I mean, depending on the location, you're, you're either looking at treating the water or you're drilling far enough to get treated water. So a lot of the times I hear the argument, are you going to, I mean, is it aid? Or how, when is the aid going to stop? And a lot of the times as Western folks, we have the luxury of saying, yeah, when is the aid going to stop? I don't remember any one of my friends here in America drilling their own well. So I don't know, like we have the infrastructure to begin with, which makes us comfortable enough to be like, yeah, I mean, why don't they do it for themselves? I actually had one guy go, can they do that for themselves? After I explained to him, that, like, we drill 110 meters. Like, you mean with shovels? He's like, yeah, with shovels. <laughs> I'm like, well, the combo is pretty much over here. But, <laughs> but um, it's, it's an incredible aspect. And, and when you get, um, the other thing, in addition to people getting back to school, if they're healthy, it makes the whole community in terms of accessing education, building up a community, everything everything else changes immediately. So I would say, like, when it, why water is essential, it's the most important aspect, and unless you attack the water issue in these communities, nothing else would change. Um, but while I'm here, I'll open it up for any questions or concerns. Hopefully no one has concerns. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, just when you were saying earlier about the whole capitalism and you know the the community has to be a part, of things, which, I, which I totally agree with. And then there's also this other part of like like income. You mentioned other organizations that but support like a yeah. Uh, so that that's great that they're doing that, but at the same token, I can see how that's very not sustainable. So uh, with Aqua Africa, have you come into Conflict with communities that are just like, well, why should I go with this organization and how it dealt with that? That's a really good point. Um, we also had like the internal struggle of 
uh, how we do assessments. Because when we initially do assessments, we don't do them based on need. We do them based on development. So we could go to a community and if they look like they need, I mean, clearly they have all the signs that they need the water well. But we usually pick communities that have built like school or some type of a clinic. They look organized. Now it doesn't have to be first grade like this, but it could be mud houses, whatever it is that they're building to make it um, what was to look like they're cohesive. So we work in those communities. We do have that struggle that we we see people that truly need it, that we want to help, that we don't want to help, and then you have those communities that are like. Well, if you're going to charge us 15%, we'll just go with this organization that's not going to charge us anything. And now I'm thinking, yeah, if I were you, I'd do the same thing. Like, i go with the cheapest portion. So, yeah, like, so there's an internal struggle in the community itself, whether what type of, uh, what was it, aid that they want to accept. And then you have our own struggle in our organization in terms of, like, helping out. Because, like you said, we definitely want it to be, there for a long time, not just sustainable, but there, serving the people. So we also have communities that like you build them a water well and like Newland, we built a water well and the community grew and then they said, and we thought it would be a good idea to build this water tank, we talked to the locals and we talked to them, said we want to do this. And um, they said, what's 15%? And we're like, well, 15% of $70,000. We're like, whoa, that's out of line. So the like the municipality got involved and said it was the development project that they wanted to the community and they came through. So um, so we've been in uh, op so the four years we've been in operation, we haven't done that. Straightforward. But um, this year, with the pediatric hospital, we wanted to gather um, patient data, post data, and or pre data and post data to see what kind of an impact we've made in the community. So I actually leave for the SS South Sudan, uh, Third Reich, <laughs> South Sudan <laughs> tomorrow, and um, I'm going to go with a couple of engineers. And then we're going to go do an assessment. Well, well, we're going to do a geologic and geographic assessment, but we have people in, um, doing a health assessment for three weeks. So we'll have data to see where, um, what type of an impact we're making in the community. Yeah. I hope so. I'm sure be yeah, and if there isn't, it will be incredibly disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And we'll be like, well, we got the water, so. <laughs> so. The future, um, it complicates things in terms of supply lines. We were really dependent on our supply lines, Uganda and uh, Ethiopia. The other thing most people don't realize is um, the continuity of the government there, the local people um, that are running it. And you have a lot of turnovers. So if you have like an administration that we're working in with as one of this, I don't know how I go back. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so this is the like the paperwork and things like because we want to make sure that it, it, what we do, everyone is um, in, on the same page. But now this guy, we found out, is actually moving from his job so because he got fired. And I'm guessing he didn't toe the line with the government. So turnover really hurts us, too. That makes what the conflict now, there's rapid turnover that kills it. The supply lines where we have two or three checkpoints before, now we have 15, 16 checkpoints. So each checkpoint, you're paying tax, um, which is just basic extortion. So the only other African gifts are <laughs> tax. <laughs> Yeah, so it just it, it makes that's how like it, and ultimately the price. So um, eleven thousand dollar project becomes a fifteen thousand, or seventy thousand project becomes a hundred thousand. And a lot of our the funny thing is you'll hear like so I'm telling my board where we're going through fifty checkpoints, and then they're like, well, and then don't bribe them, and you're like, 
they got guns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, we won't get through. Like, it's not, they don't play that game. Then it, and again, they're human beings too. And that's an important point to understand where if you're a police officer, you're making, you know, $45,000, $50,000, of course you're not going to take a $5 bribe. So that, that doesn't happen. In, in South Sudan, when you're working on a checkpoint for six months, you haven't been paid at all, you have kids depending on you. That's a different story. Not to say that's legitimate in any way, but you just have to understand it from we're, we're all human. And the conditions are just, are just desperate. They're not inherently corrupt. The situation is corrupt. So that gives you a better understanding when you're doing developmental work not judging the people as a whole and kind of understand. Um. Yeah, um, it, it's so good. Like these things are all coming back again. They're, they're people. So when we're doing this thing, or when we were doing the last water tank. Um, as, oh, here, this, as, as the, this is the mile radius, um, and they have to drill all these trenches for the water system to go in. Now, it depends on where you put the water, uh, what was it, distribution, on how much they want to work. So, if it's a half a mile away from me, why would I work as hard as Bob? You know, like, we both work hard, and from that point forward, Bob doesn't have to work. So they're like, well, and, like, just understanding that of the people. So the thing we devised is you pay these people, the community pays them to do it. Unless you pay them, they're not going to want to do it because they fight over, like, um, if it's further than that or further than that. So they have that disagreement. The other thing that, like, the people would say is, like, if you have two or three of them here, it won't benefit that other two. So communities fight with each other. So just them being people, people politics takes over. And then you would think if we're doing projects there, they'll all be grateful and they'll celebrate. It's not, it doesn't work like that. Some people will react differently depending on the incentive involved. So. No, that's very true, and I think that's a very strong point. We, we've done like four years worth of work without actually focusing on the health aspect of it. And I think we did the community And honestly, we didn't have the extra. So, we did what you need. Yeah, we just did, we just did what we knew. But as we get, um, as time goes on and as we try to improve ourselves, even talking about this, engaging in this way, doing the measurements, seeing where the people are, and attacking those aspects, I think it's critical. So, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, so in the community, um, I, I know I, I sound like a broken record saying this, but so this is. This one, right? Yeah. So in the community, 
I think a lot of them is finished without full engagement in the community. You just if you want to just do a project without like them understanding what's going on, full buy-in, it's going to collapse because different people have different mentalities and like different interests. So when we're talking to these people, we clearly explain to them how, how much it's going to cost and um, all the materials involved in making that project happen. And then we allow them to express their objective. And you will hear objective. So fortunately for us, we're, we're African. So they're not shy when it comes to Africa. So like, because we look like them, we talk like them, you're like, look, you're going to hear what I have to say. And that's like 10, 15 minutes, each person voicing their objective. So it's really important you listen to that and you find ways. One of the guys, like I told you, his name is not Bob, but I use, I just call him Bob, but he's the one who brought up and said, look, man, I'm not going to dig a mile and a half for like, and it's not going to impact, or I'm not going to dig a mile and it's not going to impact my location. So like, you got to find another way where, where we can burst for our effort. So reflecting of what we did. So we're not just going to do a project. So it's important. I never got that. I, I thought if we go and do a project, everybody will be happy. And everybody will be, you know, like we're helping you kind of a mentality. And I just, I was like, why would you be selfish? I would do the same thing. Like, even if I don't voice it because I don't want to sound like I'm dissenting, you're telling me to dig a mile, like for three days, I'm going to be like, that water better come to my house. So, um, so I mean, I know I took a long path to answer your question, but that's the community engagement. I think is critical. Yeah, and sometimes they'll be like, we don't want that. Exactly, and then you spend so much money and you leverage other Yeah. Yeah, and you go into these communities and you tell them, hey, this is what we're going to do, deal with it. You're going to be like, this is what we're going to do to subvert it, deal with it. You know, it's kind of like, it's a, it's a different, with, with anybody. And a good example is, like, a lot of people are like, these things are dysfunctional, blah, blah, blah. I don't understand why don't they come together. You ever been to a town hall meeting? Like, that stuff is dysfunctional. <laughs> like, my son is brilliant. I can't believe you, blah, 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 blah. And then he's like, well, your son is not that brilliant. Anyways, like, that stuff happens, even in these communities. You know, like, people have different kind of engagement. So, but the other advantage that we do have is tell them, like, it's going to cost 50, 50%. And then the, the thing they'll say is, like, is this government money? So why isn't it free? Then you're like, it's not government money. And they're like, and then what is, where is it coming from? They're like, well, from a place called Nebraska. And they're like, what's Nebraska? <laughs> so it's just like it's a different, different kind of a thing where people need to appreciate where it comes from and that engagement. migration is a pattern. It's a good one. I saw a couple of days ago a uh, Facebook um, meme and it was like post in it. Blocked and a guy looks at him and he's like, oh, I'm from all of these places? Usually for us, you know, like if they're like 5,000 years ago, you know, where was your like great-great-grandfather from? I'd be like, well, from right there. Like, we lived in the same like none of us <laughs> So when it comes to migration, uh, like 
portion, especially the South Sudan I know. Now, I'm not talking about Darfur because we're not herders. We can migrate to different places. They in the same kind of um, location. But now with the civil war, like the past 21 years, a lot of them, there's internal displaced um, IDP, you know, and then there's people that are immigrated out of the country, like my family and myself. But in terms of nature, we're we're much more um, like stay in your own like location, which works for us better in terms of development. But development is really impossible if people are migrating all the time. If they're nomads and then drill a water well, at least they're gone. But that, I don't know, does that answer kind of answer your question? No, or? Well, I was just wondering if there's like a solid path here in the US where it's used where a lot of people are looking for. Oh, so okay. Die off of those. Well, in terms of that, not really, not, not really. Um, there was, so, out of war for like four years and their stability, and then after you went back into war. But in those four years, the US population um, increased from I think it was 100,000 to 150,000. So, like, it skyrocketed, and a lot of it came from the rural community. But it's not, we don't have the education infrastructure where, like, like well, I'm done with primary school, I'm going to go somewhere else for because better opportunity. So a lot of our rural communities grow up subsistence agriculture. That's what you like. Rarely you can buy your food. So I mean that I say that to say that, but time that might change. But currently, it doesn't happen. And also, I'm not an expert. From what I'm. What was your second part of the question? Um, as far as like climate. Oh, so. Yeah. so South Sudan has like great advantages when it comes to water. We have the Nile River, which goes through the country, um, goes through Khartoum. Most of you know, like the Nile flows north, so um, we have that that cuts to our whole entire country. We have a vast amount of groundwater, which is uh, you have to drill, but, and we're subtropical too. So when you think of Sudan, when we were one country, we were the biggest country. Not Africa, but the north side, which a lot of people know the desert, but the south side is a lot of tropical. So it's, um, we have, our portion is actually part of the Greek Belt. So we have a lot of variable land, have a lot of water resources, which is access to the Okay, so thank you. I was just going to ask, I was just going to tell one. This one took two and a half months. Um, the next one will take us a month. Got everything is you have to work from scratch, buy lines, get the system where we're going to like purchase stuff. But now I'm like or a hundred percent depends on which we can buy. But efficiency has gone up, so it's gonna be two months down a month. Yeah, the security is a huge issue. So I, I went back two weeks ago. Um, part of why I went back, I needed to transport our um, train from, from, actually from Uganda, crossing the SS. So we were crossing into one point, and every one of them, were, um, given the platform, like, I had to told you. That came with it. Uh, so they have to make whether they want to engage or not. But the problem is in the in South Sudan, outside of Juba, Juba is secure, like most Civil War countries, that capital city is secure, outside of that is the Where we're working, unfortunately, outside of that. So trying to get to that location is kind of because of the desperate distortion. Well, and that, that's the thing. I mean, a lot of it. 
Because I know those are not the kind of jam. So for them, I tell them every time we go and then we try to keep them accountable, whatever, and they want to see them, they're not. But it is difficult to come back to them and be like, well, there's you know, five checkpoints. And then they'll be like, hey, am I here? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The how to protect those lines, electric power. Is that no, that, that is an issue. Like a part, part of the solar panel is dust. And then it says, and the rice pushes the um, rain, rice is not like that, but it's done around hours, the rice is dry. We have dust, that's what the solar panel. So that's one thing that happens. And this is like more important not to do anything like that, but that. So that's what we have to plan. Um, for the water tank we're building, the village supplier, we had a partnership with the school. For them to provide the school, provide the water tank, and then we supply the school and the surrounding. And how you again, we have to provide the so that means like a drawn on contract where if anything is stolen, liability falls on the hospital and then they um, supply the so, yeah. Well, um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Again, thank you so much for taking the time out of for the end of the day. And um, please, not even the Aqua Africa, but any other organization of water that that water work in uh, global health. Don't I mean a lot of people say like we're millennials and uh, because we're millennials like with lots of it or whatever it is. Don't don't lose part of it because the people on the other side is like the last line of defense. So by you giving up on them, signing them off. So the hope don't let them convince you to block them. So thank you so much for having me. So we're all done. Um, after this, we just have a closing and award ceremony down in the main auditorium. And otherwise, thank you so much for coming to the Global Health Conference Midwest.